Hey, y'all, Scott Horton here for CashIntoCoins.com. So you want to buy some Bitcoins? CashIntoCoins.com makes it fast, easy, and safe to get Bitcoins. Just deposit the money into their account at any of the major banks they support, and then just email them a picture of the receipt in your Bitcoin address, and you get your Bitcoins. Almost always the same day it clears. In a tough, competitive new market, CashIntoCoins.com has the advantage. A great system and great customer service to keep you coming back. That's CashIntoCoins.com. Just click the link in the right margin at ScottHorton.org. All right, y'all. Welcome back to the show. I'm Scott Horton. This is my show, The Scott Horton Show. I won't be here tomorrow because I'll be hopping on a plane to Washington, D.C. I'm giving a speech at the Future Freedom Foundation Conference Within a Conference at the International Students for Liberty Conference at the Grand Hyatt Hotel in Washington this uh, Saturday. It's going on Saturday and Sunday, but I don't know. Yeah. And Oliver Stone's going to be there and Jeremy Scahill and Stephen Kinzer, and Robert Higgs, and uh, Sheldon Richmond, and it's going to be awesome. Jeff Tucker's going to be there. All kinds of great folk are going to be there, and so it's going to be great. That's in D.C. this weekend. Uh, if you're not too snowed in, I uh, hope to see you there. All right, good. So uh, speaking of the Future Freedom Foundation, Andy Worthington writes for them from time to time, uh, maybe even a bit more often than that. They're at FFF.org. Uh, Andy's blog is at andyworthington.co.uk. And, of course, he's the author of the book, The Guantanamo Files, and he's the director, producer of the movie, Outside the Law, Stories from Guantanamo. Welcome back to the show. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good, Scott. Yeah, yeah, nice to be back talking to you. Good, good. I'm happy to have you here. Uh, so, Guantanamo is still open, and uh, I guess it was noted in the news the other day, well, you know, of course, Obama paid some lip service in the State of the Union. Never mind that. It was noted the other day that it's the anniversary, the 12th anniversary, of the Bush administration's abandonment of the Geneva Conventions. Yeah. So, what's the big deal? <laughs> well, you know, when, you, uh, when you're at war, Scott, and you uh, decide to hold people, uh, take them off the battlefield... Uh, there are two things that you're supposed to do. One is that you're supposed to uh, ascertain whether you have the right people, um, uh, which the Bush administration decided they didn't want to do. Uh, the, the way of doing that is that if they're not wearing military uniforms, then you hold Article 5 tribunals close to the time and place of capture to find out whether you've got civilians or combatants. The U.S. did that in the first Gulf War and um, held about 1,200 tribunals and in 900 cases realized they got the wrong people and sent them home. So they didn't do that. They just rounded everybody up and said, uh, we're going to have you anyway. And, um, and then they um, refused to um, allow them to be um, held as prisoners of war uh, with all the protections of the Geneva Conventions. And the, the baseline protection of the Geneva Conventions, Scott, is that... Um, is that you are not allowed to torture or abuse the people in your control. So by not doing that, uh, President Bush was um, making it clear, really, that no rules applied to these men and that, therefore, the United States could do anything it wanted with them. And pretty soon, of course, uh, what happened was that they started torturing them. Mm. Yep, by the tens of thousands. Anyway, we'll get to that in just a second. <laughs> but but uh, so... Uh, the thing of it is, isn't it correct? Is this the memo that says, yeah, but the Taliban, they didn't sign the Geneva Convention, so screw them. Isn't that the law? If they didn't sign it, then we don't have to abide by it either. Well, this is, yeah, this is the race to the bottom theory of, uh, of uh, international treaties. Um, you know, it, it, it doesn't really matter, Scott, what, who you're up against um, and the way they behave if you don't adhere to the rules that you uh, say are important and that are the kind of things that keep us away from being um, from descending into barbarism. Uh, then you descend into barbarism. So uh, you know, I mean, I think that's really one of the things that happened after 9/11. Most fundamentally, you know, when the the gloves came off and Dick Cheney, you know, was there boasting about how we were going to have to go to the dark side. You know, what does it mean, the dark side, Dick? Well, that means you know a place where we torture people where we hold people indefinitely without charge or trial, uh, where we disappear people, where we set up uh, networks of secret prisons to torture people, where we, you know, we arrange for other countries to host these prisons for us because we can't do it ourselves, because it's illegal. 
uh, all of this. And, you know, w- what is the difference between this and a fully functioning, nasty, totalitarian place? Well, I don't think there is any, really, is there? Right. Well, and then the other thing is, too, is the dark side means we're making up all the rules as we go along. And since they're all a bunch of nitwits, they end up ruining everything. And so and they turn their own empire into a laughing stock. I mean, it's kind of a bitter chuckle, but everybody in the whole world knows that Guantanamo is full and has always been full of a bunch of nobodies, a big publicity stunt of how evil America is. What the hell is that supposed to prove? Well, you know, I don't know. I mean, what amazes me after all this amount of time, Scott, is that people really don't get that. You know, that this is um, this is a place that is um, oh, I mean, primarily... I, I meant, to, uh, say, I meant to say six and a half billion people in the world get it. The <laughs> Americans don't count, but everybody else in the world knows from, you know... Well, you know, but I mean, it's interesting because partly, partly, obviously, you're right. You know, this place is for show and people should realize that, um, you know, that a bunch of people are being victimized for... For that purpose, for scaring people, for for, for putting up a front, um, but it's also a place where you know most crucially, um, people who you know, with a very small exception, uh, a, a very small number of people are an exception to this, but the majority of the people held at Guantanamo, you know, throughout its history, have been in two camps: either completely innocent people um, in the wrong time and place, you know, many of whom were sold because the, the Americans were offering bounty payments, huge bounty payments. But let's say the bulk of the people that were held were soldiers. They were in Afghanistan. They were involved with the Taliban one way or another, or militarily or in a support way, um, fighting the Northern Alliance before the 9/11 attacks. That then, you know, they then became involved in the um, in in in, uh, in a conflict with the United States after the United States invaded. And yet, you know, the shorthand for these guys for all of these 12 years that this nonsense has been going on is that they're terrorists. Uh, we we have all been played by the Bush administration, and Obama hasn't done enough to um, get rid of this this notion that actually people who are fighting against us are terrorists. There appears to be no such thing anymore as soldiers. What we're up against are insurgents, and insurgents are terrorists. Um, so you know that's what I find really disappointing. You know we've got a bunch of guys in Guantanamo who've been there for twelve years, longer than the First World War and the Second World War put together. We still have, you know, major players in the United States political scene who want to hold these guys forever, um, and yet they they were never anybody in the first place. They were guys who, you know, at the best were were you know were part of some long forgotten military conflict that had nothing to do with America before the nine eleven attacks. It's ridiculous. Right. Well, and that's the whole thing too. Is they weren't even insurgents. They were the government of. Afghanistan, almost all of it, and and the terror there or the foot soldiers of it, and the terrorists were the commie Northern Alliance uh, that you know America came and ended up backing that were on the verge of total defeat at the time of the 9/11 attacks and the American intervention over there. So they weren't even they weren't even really you know uh, unlawful enemy belligerents or whatever kind of. Uh, uh, you know, technicality. They were actually just foot soldiers of a government. One, admittedly, that the American government, you know, uh, bombed and replaced. But still, yeah. And, and yeah, at, the, at that the time, anyway, the... I'm not saying that would really. I don't think that definition might, or maybe it would count again now. But say a couple of years ago, you could get away with saying the Taliban is the insurgency and not the dominant force in the country, or something like that. Right. Uh, right. But not back then. Anybody who was arrested back in the fall of '01, they were the foot soldier of the government that was being defeated. So that makes them maybe a POW, but it doesn't make them a terrorist at all. No, absolutely. But you know, but that that is the uh, the Alice through the Looking Glass world that we've ended up in in the last twelve years. Yeah. Is that you know things that um, things that made sense uh, and were logical and uh, you know and had a sense of proportion about them twelve years ago have gone out the window. Uh, and you know, and, and as I say, Scott, I find it I find it depressing that um, far too many people don't realise that, that what's happened. I mean, they're content to to do what the government tells them, which is to look the other way, and uh, and to believe them when they say, you know, these are, these are the bad guys. You don't really need to know anything more than that. Right. All right. Now, hey, in the last couple of minutes of this segment, maybe we can get one more question too. But uh, could you talk a little bit more about those Article Five? 
uh, I forget, that's the Geneva Convention, Article 5 mandates, but then there's uh, whatever uh, military law that outlines, uh, outlines how a military commission is supposed to work in the battlefield. This isn't, uh, you know, guilt or innocence. This is, do we care about you at all to hold you, or do we turn you right. loose because you're nobody? And you were saying that that worked really well in the first Gulf War, and that was the process that, you know, I guess has been developed since the American Revolution, which Donald Rumsfeld threw out the window in favor of pay the Pakistanis, Bounties for as many you know people as they can turn over to us. Yeah, well, they were called, you know they're called competent tribunals. I mean, sometimes they get referred to as battlefield tribunals, and they are specifically for making sure that if you're um, dealing with a non-straightforward military conflict, i.e., you haven't got two bunches of guys out on a field, both wearing uniforms and carrying national flags. Um, but when when it's um, slightly more irregular than that, that you you know you're prone to make mistakes. You know, there's a guy wheeling a cart full of his farming stuff through the middle of a of a conflict zone, and you pick him up, and he says, "No, guys, I'm a farmer." And you know, you you hold these tribunals to find out whether that's the case or not. You know, it's amazing the 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 results from Iraq, where nearly three out of four cases they held these tribunals, they got the wrong people, they sent them home. You know, you can see why Guantanamo is full of nobodies, literally full of nobodies. When you know when you when you you extrapolate those kind of figures three out of four uh, to Guantanamo and you know and that that, that pretty broadly fits with uh, the kind of nonsense that was going on in that place that these were people who had there been that type of screening that type of screening which had been pioneered by the U.S. Uh, they would never have ended up being sent there in the first place you know and these are the guys that you know Dunleavy who was the uh, one of the early commanders of Guantanamo, you know, referred to the, you know, he was annoyed at the number of Mickey Mouse detainees who were being sent to Guantanamo from Afghanistan. Right, yeah, and of course, um, uh, you know, people might think now, well, yeah, but Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is there and all that, but they weren't even brought there until the CIA prisons were shut down, at least as far as we know, uh, back in 2005. Before that, it was nothing but nobodies, right? They finally brought some guilty yeah. people just to dress the damn thing up. Well, a few years ago, I spoke to uh, to Larry Wilkerson, who was Colin Powell's chief of staff, and he, right? he told me exactly that. He said, you know, that this is the, <laughs> this is the thing, really, is that you know when they moved these guys to... Guantanamo in September 2006, so they could actually say, "Hey, we, you know, we've got some terrorists in Guantanamo," right. because before that they didn't. Right, that um, was Colin know, Powell's right hand analysis. man there. The, he was the Secretary of State at the time, Colonel uh, Lawrence Wilkerson, who's told me on this show before that uh, he would be perfectly happy. Years ago, he told me he'd be perfectly happy to testify against Dick Cheney in front of the grand jury uh, yeah. for. The torture spree back then. And we'll get back uh, and talk a little bit more about Guantanamo. Well, a lot more about Guantanamo and torture and the rest of it with our friend Andy Worthington. AndyWorthington.co.uk. Back after this. Hey, all Scott here. First, I want to take a second to thank all the show's listeners, sponsors, and supporters for helping make this show what it is. I literally couldn't do it without you. And now I want to tell you about the newest way to help support the show. Whenever you shop at Amazon.com, stop by ScottHorton.org first. And just click the Amazon logo on the right side of the page. That way the show will get a kickback from Amazon's end of the sale. It won't cost you an extra cent. And it's not just books. Amazon.com sells just about everything in the world except cars, I think. So whatever you need, they've got it. Just click the Amazon logo on the right side of the page at ScottHorton.org or go to ScottHorton.org slash Amazon. All right, all right. Here's one of my favorite George W. Bush clips ever, everybody. Turn down this dress in 45 for a second here. And that common Article 3 says that, you know, there will be no outrages upon human dignity. It's, it's, it's like, it's very vague. This, yeah, poor guy. That's after the uh, Hamdan decision that said that, uh, no, the president does not have the authority to suspend participation in the Geneva Conventions, and they do apply. And it's funny that Bush's complaint there is that, oh, come on, no outrages upon human dignity. That could mean anything. <laughs> and we get all this stuff that we like doing to these people. And what's funny about it is he's right that it's vague, but it's written like that deliberately, of course, to be all-inclusive. If you think it might be over the line, you cannot do it to your detainee. Get it? That's the point. 
And poor Bush is saying, oh, come on. I mean, that includes things that are only half torture and, and two-thirds torture, too. And an outrage upon human dignity. I like outraging human dignity. Uh, anyway, so that's his game. Um, and so at some point they finally did stop torturing people, but not before tens of thousands were tortured. And this is a little bit off of just the Guantanamo beat, Andy, but uh, I know you're you know well aware of all this history and the le so-called legalities behind it and the rest of it. But ultimately, uh, somewhere around tens of thousands of Iraqis and Afghans were tortured in those wars. And uh, basically what happened was the uh, the legal theory from Afghanistan and from Guantanamo Bay uh, kind of just filtered its way through uh, different chains of command uh, into the battlefield in Iraq, where then any Iraqi resistance fighter uh, all of a sudden was under the same rules as the Taliban and Al-Qaeda in, uh, you know, over there near the Duran line, you know, fighting it out with bin Laden. And... So what they ended up doing, it was, you know, during the entire occupation of Afghanistan, uh, well, and particularly Iraq, it was just completely lawless. And as Tony Lugaranis put it to PBS uh, Frontline, he said, look, we torch them on the side of the road, we torch them in their front yard, in their living room, and in their backyard, and in front of their wives, and in front of their kids, and sometimes we killed them. And you want to know how we tortured them? We tortured them this way and that, electrified cages and, you know, whatever crazy stuff they could come up with. And not all just, you know, top-down CIA-type torture, but just the average grunt out on patrol was told the same rules as the CIA and special forces in Afghanistan was that grab whom you must, do what you want, the gloves are off, These all these people knock down the towers, man, just go out there and get them. And so tens of thousands of people were tortured. And meanwhile, the American people, I think if you surveyed them, would say, well, yeah, I heard that they dunked one guy underwater three times or something like that when this was a gigantic regime of uh, torture on a massive scale and for years on end. And, and then, you know, sometimes they'll maybe mention the outsourcing of torture to the Bada Brigade in Iraq and that kind of thing. But, you know, that's only the fringes of the discussion, if you ask me. The, the center of it is the top-down regime from the president, the vice president, and all the way through uh, the intelligence services and the military. And... And I guess that's what the 6,000-page torture report that they just won't release is about because they're afraid that if the American people really had any idea what was in there, that this would be enough maybe to bring those Republicans back to D.C. for, you know, to Virginia for trial. Very well put, Scott. You know, there is one thing that I should add to that, which is that on the very same day that George Bush stood in the White House Rose Garden saying, you know, we... You know those secret prisons that I told you we didn't have? Well, we did, but we've closed them, and now uh, and we're sending those guys to Guantanamo, these 14 high-value detainees. The very day that, that, that he uh, announced that the black sites were closing, the Army Field Manual was reissued containing an appendix called Appendix M, which I encourage listeners to look up, Appendix M of the Army Field Manual. It contains a list of torture techniques which can be approved for use by uh, by high up officials um, in certain um, in certain uh, you know when it's called for uh, it's not specified when it will be used but it's basically as soon as the torture program came to an end uh, it migrated to an appendix of the army field manual so that it can continue in some form mm -hmm. or another um, you know we certainly don't don't see that it's on the same massive massive industrial scale as it was when those two hideous wars in Afghanistan and Iraq were at, you know, at maximum impact. And as you've so well expressed, Scott, you know, tens of thousands of people were tortured who had nothing to do with anything. Um, but it's still there. It's still there as, as, you know, as an official part of U.S. policy. Well, man, I want somebody to WikiLeak that Senate report, because that 6,000-page <laughs> report, I mean, after look, it was put together by Dianne Feinstein's staff, and... You know, she's actually been pretty good on the torture issue. I don't know every detail. There may be caveats to that going back, but uh, lately anyway. Uh, but you can't expect her staff to really tell you everything you need to know. This is would still be, if not a whitewash, a very mainstream Senate 
committee version of what happened, but still they are scared to death of releasing this thing, and they claim they're quibbling about some details of fact here or there, but it's the release of the entire report, which I guess some who have seen it are saying that this is like the Pentagon Papers of the torture program, man. There's so much in here. Um, you know, that I guess it could really take over the entire political discussion for a little while, like the NSA stuff, and they're just scared to 24 death. 24 hours, you know? maybe? <laughs> I mean, can you imagine you know, Marcy we were going to get a 6,000 page report like that? I didn't know. When, uh, people will read the press release and they'll talk about it for 24 hours and then Kim Kardashian will be wearing a new no, top. Yeah. You, know, <laughs> you know how <laughs> it goes. That's quite <laughs> uh, I, think yeah, the, I, I hate the to overstate all, it. I the evidence is already out there. You know, people can have a look at the CIA Inspector General report from 2004, which was finally uh, released years ago. Mm-hmm. They can have a look at the Senate, uh, the Senate's report into de- detainee treatment. That was the Senate Armed Service Committee's report into detainee treatment, which came out uh, 2009, I think. It was the, at the very end of the Bush administration, actually. Um, that's a 300-and-something page analysis of how exactly uh, the systematic torture of prisoners developed. It's an absolutely fantastic document. Uh, you know, this is all public knowledge. You know, the 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 the, the sad thing is that the uh, the case for the indictment of the senior Bush administration officials and their lawyers and and everybody else who helped, you know, is, is actually out there. Uh, the problem, of course, is that you know, no, there's no willingness in the corridors of power to pursue it. Um, that said, I would dearly love to see this report and, uh, and as unredacted as possible. Yeah, well, good luck to us all on that. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, hey, these are the days of, of WikiLeaks, and it can be done. I mean, look at what Edward Snowden got away with downloading and and liberating for the people. So uh, somebody's cousin is a staffer on that Senate committee can get us that thing. <laughs> Put it on the Pirate Bay. Come on. All right. And now um, uh, there's another thing I wanted to ask you uh, here real quick at the end was uh, – about the hunger strike and how many people are still on it and how's it going and uh, what's being done about it. Well, the the last I've heard, uh, Scott, is that Shaka Arma, the last British guy in Guantanamo, has said that there are 34 guys on a hunger strike now. 17 of them are being force fed, um, and you know that that that, that that's a, just an increase of one from um, a report from him from about a month ago. So. Uh, you know, it's not it's not taking off in a major way, but that's still a significant number of people. And of course, you know, the horrible thing is that the, for the guys who are being force fed, they're strapped down to the restraint chair twice a day, and uh, the tubes pumped up through their nose, and uh, you know, and it's a pretty disgusting process. Um, Shaka Arma and a couple of other prisoners have a long-standing legal challenge from last summer, in which they're trying to get judges to tell the government that. that that they're not allowed to force feed them, uh, which uh, the district court um, had to turn down because of a legal precedent, you know, whereby Congress told the courts, you know, anything to do with the treatment of prisoners in the war on terror is not for us to uh, to, to interfere with. Uh, but they appealed um, to the D.C. Circuit Court, um, a formerly notoriously right-wing court that seems to be mellowing slightly these days, uh, Judges there um, heard, heard the case in, in the fall and have just delivered a ruling saying that although they can't um, order the government to uh, stop force-feeding the prisoners, they think that there is enough to the case to send it back down to the district court for them to um, have further investigations into what the rights of prisoners are, the extent to which prisoners may be able to challenge the ways in which they're treated by the government. So... You know, this is all, all seems very abstract, and it's not led to any um, anything immediate. But legally, it's actually quite significant that, that um, judges in the in the generally known as the conservative court of appeals um, are actually saying, you know, w- w- I think we need some oversight here on the way that, that prisoners are being treated. So, you know, there's there's progress there. The main area that we're looking for progress in, though, Scott, is that. Um, you know, since the big hunger strike last year that forced President Obama's hand, he said, I'm going to start releasing prisoners, I'm going to appoint some envoys, we're going to have some movement here. 
Well, yeah, we have had some movement. He has released 11 men. Uh, there are 155 men still in Guantanamo, and 77 of those men are men who have been cleared for release. Um, all but one of them um, over four years ago when Obama's interagency task force reviewed the cases and said, look, these are guys that we don't want to put on trial and that we don't want to carry on holding. Uh, these are guys that, you know, we want out of here. Uh, and yet they're still held there. So we're waiting for action from President Obama. More than 11 men. We want all the rest of these people to be released. And what people really need to be aware of is that the majority of these 77 men, 56 of them, are Yemenis. And no Yemenis have been released from Guantanamo for years. Um, and, you know, because Yemen is regarded as a, as a nation that's a host of terrorism. Yeah, uh, well, they're afraid of the headline, the Congress politics of the headline. They get over themselves and release prisoners to Yemen. It's time yeah, for this. we got to go. I'm to sorry. To Thanks so much. AndyWorthington.co.uk. Thanks, Andy. Okay. Thanks, Scott. Bye. Hey, all Scott here. Ever wanted to help support the show and own silver at the same time? Well, a friend of mine, libertarian activist Arlo Pignati, has invented the alternative currency with the most promise of them all, QR Silver Commodity Discs, the first ever QR code one-ounce silver pieces. Just scan the back of one with your phone and get the instant spot price. They're perfect for saving or spending at the market. And anyone who donates $100 or more to The Scott Horton Show at scotthorton.org slash donate gets one. That's scotthorton.org slash donate. And if you'd like to learn and order more, send them a message at CommodityDiscs.com or check them out on Facebook at slash Commodity Discs. And thanks. Hey, I'm Scott Horton here to tell you about this great new book by Michael Swanson, The War State. In The War State, Swanson examines how Presidents Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy both expanded and fought to limit the rise of the new national security state after World War II. If this nation is ever to live up to its creed of liberty and prosperity for everyone, we are going to have to abolish the empire. Know your enemy. Get The War State by Michael Swanson. It's available at your local bookstore or at Amazon.com in Kindle or in paperback. Just click the book in the right margin at scotthorton.org or thewarstate.com. What was the only interest group in D.C. pushing war with Syria last summer? APAC and the Israel lobby. What's the only interest group in D.C. pushing to sabotage the nuclear deal with Iran right now? APAC and the Israel lobby. Why doesn't the president force an end to the occupation of Palestine, a leading cause of terrorist attacks against the United States? APAC and the Israel lobby. The Council for the National Interest is pushing back, putting America first and educating the people about what's really at stake in the Middle East. Help support their important work at councilforthenationalinterest.org. Hey, I'm Scott Horton here for the Future of Freedom, the monthly journal of the Future Freedom Foundation at fff.org slash subscribe. Since 1989, FFF has been pushing an uncompromising moral and economic case for peace, individual liberty, and free markets. Sign up now for the Future Freedom, featuring founder and president Jacob Hornberger, as well as Sheldon Richmond, James Bovard, Anthony Gregory, Wendy McElroy, and many more. It's just $25 a year for the print edition, 15 per year to read it online. That's fff.org slash subscribe. And tell them Scott sent you.